Good morning. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. Happy New Year, everybody. It's still the 31st for me, so I have yet to celebrate it, but it might be the first where you are. Or maybe you're just getting ready to celebrate it just like me. Maybe you're going to listen to this in a few days, and this is all irrelevant. (laughs) So this is just going to be a little mini episode to wrap up the year. I wanted to tell you guys a true crime story about Jennifer Hudson. By the way, I've read your guys' comments, and I've seen that some people have mentioned the inconsistency in the timing of my episodes. Look, you know, I have information in front of me, and I can stretch it out, or I can cut it. But at the end of the day, it's not my story. I'm not making it up. So, I mean, I could sit there and ramble forever and make my my episodes longer, but then somebody out there would say that they don't like that. So at the end of the day, I can't please everybody. I mean, what can I tell you? If you don't like the short episodes, listen to the long ones. If you don't like the long episodes, listen to the short ones. I know you guys don't know me, but I am chaos. I'm just not a consistent person. So, hey, and I'm not sorry for it. So you're probably wondering, why are we talking about Jennifer Hudson, who's clearly walking around live and well? Well, Jennifer actually suffered a horrific tragedy early on in her career, just as her star was beginning to rise. Jennifer Hudson was very, very close with her family. She was born on September 12, 1981 in Chicago, Illinois. Her mother's name was Darnell Donnerston, and her father was named Samuel Simpson. She had a brother named Jason and a sister named Julia, and Jennifer was the youngest of the three. All three children were raised solely by their mother, Darnell. Their father, Samuel, had left the family early on and apparently had fathered 27 children in total. This is according to Jennifer. There are 11 girls and 16 boys. Jennifer says that she has met some of them, but not all of them. The children were raised Baptist and were very involved with the church. Jennifer started performing at a young age, around seven years old, singing with the church choir, as well as performing in school plays and community theater productions and local talent shows. Her biggest influences were Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, and Patti LaBelle. In 2002, Jennifer signed her first recording contract with an independent label in Chicago. They ended up releasing her from her five-year contract in 2004 so that she could appear in American Idol. Jennifer appeared on season three of American Idol, This was in 2004. She was voted off the show after placing number seven. That season's winner was Fantasia Burino. In 2006, she appeared in her first film role playing Effie White in Dreamgirls. She actually beat out hundreds of other professional performers in that role, including Fantasia. Her performance absolutely shook the audiences. She won several awards, including an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. At just 25 years old, this made her the youngest black person to win an Oscar in a competitive acting category. Following all of this success, she was signed to a new record company, and she released her debut studio album in 2008, which was certified gold in the United States, sold over a million copies worldwide, and won the Grammy for Best R&B Album. So at this time, Jennifer is now really successful and She's doing a lot of work, and she's traveling, so she moves out of her family's house, but she remained really close with them. Her brother and sister, Julia and Jason, continue to live with their mother, Darnell, as well as Julia's young son, Julian. I couldn't find any information on Julian's biological father, but in 2006, Julia married another guy named William Balfour. Or Balfour? Balfour? Let me look it up. Balfour, or Balfour. Balfour, okay. So, Jennifer and the family were not fond of William. He was a high school dropout and a career criminal, and his father and brother were ex-cons. More importantly, he treated Julia like shit. He was also on parole for an attempted murder conviction from 1992. Jennifer begged her not to marry him. Nevertheless, Julia fell in love with William, and they got married, and they raised Julian together. Their marriage was really tumultuous, and it didn't take long for things to kind of fall apart. 
Early in 2008, Julia went on a trip to Japan with Jennifer, and William started sleeping around while she was gone. Julia was just fed up with the guy, and she separated from him in February 2009, but he kept coming around and threatening her. He would also come by and just see if she was home and see if she had other guys at her house. I read in one source that Julia's mother, Darnell, was actually the one who threw him out. According to court records, William had threatened, If you ever leave me, I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to kill your family first. You will be the last to die. He had reportedly threatened to kill her and her family at least two dozen times, but Julia, I guess, didn't really believe him. She just didn't think he was serious. On October 23, 2008, Julian is now seven years old. That night, the family got together and had some cake and celebrated Julia's 31st birthday. The next morning at about 8 a.m., William showed up to the house asking Julia, why are you ignoring me? Julia testified that William had seen some balloons in her house that were actually a birthday gift from another man who she was seeing. And William allegedly punched at the balloons before leaving. Julia had to leave for work, so William threatened her again, gave her a little warning, just like always, and she just left for work. She left for work at about 8.10 a.m., and as she recalls, William left around that time as well. Around 9 a.m., neighbors had heard gunshots, but they didn't report it to the police. See, apparently, it wasn't unusual to hear gunshots in this neighborhood. William alleges that when he left the house, he got on a train on the public transit and went home. However, the investigation found that his public transit card was not used on that day, and he wasn't on the security footage from the train station either. Also, cell phone towers actually placed him close to Julia's home right around 9 a.m., or up until 9 a.m. To this day, William insists that he's innocent and he didn't do this, but what's believed happened is that he came back to the house and shot through the door, immediately hitting Jason Hudson. Then when William walked further into the house, Darnell walked into the living room and he shot her. He then grabbed seven-year-old Julian, who is his stepson, and they got into Jason's vehicle and drove away. At some point this morning, William dropped his own vehicle off, like, at a nearby high school or something, and then he went back and took Jason's car. So William takes Julian, and they drive over to William's girlfriend's apartment. Yeah, he literally just killed this family because his ex-wife has a new boyfriend, and meanwhile, he's got his new girlfriend pregnant. Okay. Around 3 p.m., Julia came home from work and she found her mother and her brother dead in a pile of blood and her son Julian nowhere to be found. Come on, the house! Please! Please, the gun. Please, the gun. Please, I don't understand what you're saying. you got to stop screaming. Somebody kill my mother. Somebody kill my mother, please. Somebody did what? Somebody kill my mother. Somebody killed your mother. Where are you? What's the address? Does she need an ambulance? I don't know. I'm scared. Please, come on. Just please send an ambulance, yes. Do you know what happened? Did she fall? No, I just got home from work, and there's a bullet in the, there's a bullet hole in my front door. There's a bullet hole in your front door? Yeah. My mama, my mama. Sorry, my mama. The, the, my ambulance, mama. the ambulance is on the way, and the police. Yes. Okay. Please. Where's my brother at? William had had a parole meeting that day, but he missed it. So now, an Amber Alert gets issued for Julian, and it's looking for him and William and the vehicle that belonged to Jason. At about 6 p.m., police arrested William at his girlfriend's house. But Julian was not there. The police take William in, and they start questioning him, and as soon as they mention a polygraph, he just clammed the fuck up. He gave them an alibi, like he was with his girlfriend or something, but when they asked the girlfriend about it, she was like, nah, he wasn't with me. He killed them. He told me he killed them. <laughs> 
Of course, as soon as all of this happened, Julia called Jennifer and told her about the tragic news. Jennifer immediately got on a plane to Chicago, and she had to identify the bodies of her mother and brother. On Saturday, October 25th, the FBI is called in to help because Julian still hasn't been found. They were able to recover William's car, which he had abandoned like at a high school or something, but they still weren't able to find Jason's car. On October 27th, Jason's vehicle was found with Julian's dead body inside. The vehicle had been sitting in this neighborhood throughout the entire weekend, but I guess nobody reported it or thought that it was weird, even though it had been included in the Amber Alert. Nobody gave it a second thought until a little chihuahua started barking at it and its owner decided to report it. Julian had died from two gunshot wounds to the head. The autopsy findings concluded that he had likely been dead in that vehicle for three days, just about, meaning that he must have been killed shortly after his uncle and grandmother were killed. Like I said, William was claiming his innocence, but for one, his alibi fell through. Also, the gun that had been used in these killings was found, it had been abandoned in a vacant lot. So one of the witnesses, a lot of these reports said it was his pregnant girlfriend, said that she saw him with that same gun in his possession just a few days before the killings. The investigation also found that William had gun residue on his clothing and on the SUV steering wheel, and they also found the car keys to Jason's car in William's pocket. And then, of course, there was the cell phone records that showed him near the house up until 9 a.m. William claimed that any evidence the police found had been planted by them, and he claimed that he had no idea who could have killed Julia's family. So the police were trying to hold him at least for the 48 hours, and then when they couldn't charge him with anything, they ended up keeping him for violating his parole, because he wasn't supposed to have possession of a gun, and he wasn't supposed to be in places where drugs would be sold. And he was. On October 30th, 2008, so just five days after the killings, Jennifer announced the start of the Hudson King Foundation for Families of Slain Victims. This is a quote from their website. It says, The specific purpose of the foundation is to care for the needs of families who have lost relatives to a violent crime. This encompasses their basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, as well as grief counseling. Julia had testified that William was a really jealous person to the point that he didn't even like it when Julian kissed her, her own son. She said, Julian couldn't kiss me. He would say, don't kiss my wife. Julian couldn't lay up under me. That is my wife. Get up off my wife. He was very jealous of Julian. What was challenging about this crime is that it was based mostly on circumstantial evidence. There were no surviving witnesses to the murders, and the physical evidence didn't exactly directly tie him to the murders. While there was gun residue on him and on the vehicle, his DNA was not found on the gun, and there were no DNA or fingerprints of his found in the SUV. Or, or I guess there were, but it didn't match him. At the end of the day, they were able to hold him because of the fact that his girlfriend said she saw him with the murder weapon. Jennifer Hudson was at the trial every day. She said that she was extremely close with her mother and that they kept in touch every single day and she thought it was really weird when she woke up on October 24th and she hadn't heard from her mother yet. In December 2008, William was arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder and an additional count of home invasion. He pled not guilty to all charges. In 2012, William spoke in court saying, My deepest sympathies go to Julian King. I loved him. I still love him. Jennifer and Julia held each other and cried. The courtroom was full of cameras and microphones, people trying to get at Jennifer with questions, hoping that she would testify. But Jennifer and her sister Julia decided that they were going to keep their feelings private. The judge in this case, Judge Burns, was really emotional about this case, and he kind of lashed out at William, saying, saying that his claims of loving Julian were an insult to everybody. Judge Burns said to William, Your heart is an arctic night, and your soul is as barren as a dark space. In the end, the judge imposed a consecutive life sentence for each of the murders, as well as 120 years for William's additional convictions for home invasion, possession of a stolen motor vehicle, and aggravated kidnapping. 
Burns said that he was certain William had killed Julian because he was in the way and he could have been a witness against him after he had already killed Darnell and Jason. Judge Burns also said to William, Julian shared his life with you. For sure he looked up to you. There is no doubt in my mind he looked up to you as you were putting bullets into his head. I just hope his terror was short-lived. Julian's biological father, Gregory King, did appear in court. He appeared to be fighting back tears as he recalled the desperate three-day search for his son that ended with his body being found. Julia and Jennifer Hudson went on to form the Julian D. King Gift Foundation. This was another foundation where they would kind of raise funds and donate things like school supplies and clothing items to children in need. Jennifer said, Where we come from, a lot of kids don't have school supplies or school clothes. Children should not have to worry about those things. When we went shopping, you got two pairs of shoes and two pairs of clothes, and we were considered blessed. We make sure these kids have school supplies and presents for the holidays. Jennifer and Julia appeared on Oprah's next chapter, and Jennifer said that she forgives William for killing her loved ones. She said, For the most part, it's not his fault. It's what he was taught, how he was brought up. She went on to say, You never had a chance. Had you had the love my mother gave us or the background, you know, that some have, then you would have stood a chance. Despite all this tragedy of losing her mother, her brother, and her nephew, Jennifer persevered. She received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2013, and she began working as a coach on the UK's version of The Voice in 2017 and became the first female coach to win. And she went on to have a pretty successful run with The Voice in the United States as well. In 2018, it was revealed that Aretha Franklin handpicked Jennifer Hudson to play her in Aretha's biopic film, Respect. Jennifer went on to receive a lot of nominations for awards for this role. Thank you so, so much for listening to my podcast. Guys, I can't tell you how grateful I am to have you tuning in for every episode. You guys are the best. I'm like astonished at the success I've had in my first year of podcasting. So thank you again. You guys mean the world to me. I wouldn't be here without you. I will be uploading some videos and pictures of this crime in <laughs> in the episode page on brokenlimelight.com. Don't forget, you can also leave a comment on the episode page if you have any strong feelings or any questions about the case. You can always leave a review on brokenlimelight.com as well as on Apple Podcasts or Facebook or whatever. Anyway, that's it. Be sure to follow me on facebook.com slash brokenlimelight so you can be updated on new episodes. Real quick before I wrap this up, just as I was finishing editing this episode, I saw the terrible news that Betty White has died today at 99 years old. She was actually just getting ready to celebrate her 100th birthday on January 17th. I've already seen a few people questioning whether or not this is a hoax. Betty's agent did come forward and say that while he thought she was going to outlive all of us, unfortunately, she did pass away today. So that's it. What a way to end 2021 without Betty White. She truly was America's treasure. Thank you. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims, there's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself or you can team up with a buddy or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.